Welcome back to Red Eyes Radio. This is Henrik Palmgren, and we are all about bringing attention to hidden knowledge, forgotten wisdom, and things that most people have no idea about. As always, we're very glad and fortunate to have you with us, listening and willing to learn something new. Today, we have an interesting program for you with Marty Leeds, who discusses the seemingly overwhelming subject of mathematics and how it unlocks an understanding of many other subjects that are to be found in his book Pi, The Great Work. And this is what we're going to talk about today. He claims spiritual doctrines, mythology and folk tales are encoded with mathematical knowledge. His book presents us with the idea that all of the math in the universe can be done using numbers 1 through 9. Stay with us for much more. Marty Leeds, it's good to talk to you. Welcome to the program and thank you for uh, taking the time talking with us here uh, today, Marty. Oh, thank you. This is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we like to do shows on on math, uh, geometry, even going into alchemy. Of course, there's a lot of topics here. I, I, I remember a program we did, uh, what is, could that be, a couple of, couple of years ago almost now with Michael uh, Schneider on some of the basics of, of of the numbers, and I think that that will probably might be the closest of where we're kind of kind of going to dovetail here here today, of course. But why don't you give us a little bit of the background in the beginning here? Uh, you have, of course written Pi, the great work, and you have an active YouTube channel with lots of good videos on on it that uh, we urge people to uh, check out. We're going to give out the URL for that later. Uh, so tell us what's what's inspired you and, and what uh, why did you write the book, uh, Marty? Uh, well, Michael S. Schneider actually was a great start. His book, uh, yeah, the, what is it, uh, 1 through 10, The uh, Creation of the Universe, is a fantastic book. Um, I basically got into alchemy and numbers. Actually, it kind of got into me. Um, I just kind of studied a lot of things throughout my life, um, really focused on nonfiction. Haven't really read a fictional book in a while. Um, and so eventually that just let, you know, and I looked into psychology and philosophy and theology and mythology, and eventually it just led me to language and numbers. Um, and I was always really intrigued by, well, the secrets, you know, the, the quote unquote secret things of um, our culture and the cultures of the past. and. Well, Freemasonry and alchemy is kind of at the top of the echelon there. So, um, yeah, it just uh, it drove me there, and that's where I've parked my car, if you will. <laughs> sure is, uh, and you've per- parked it well, as you say, as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. What, what is uh, what is Pi, and and why should we even care about this, Marty? Um, pi is well, just the most elusive number in mathematics, and it's one of the most important numbers. Um, and when I got into pi, um, I, I was just intrigued by number one. It starts with a three. And a lot of the, you know, well, number one, you have like the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in Hinduism, you have Shiva, Brahman, and Vishnu. And this trinity just seems to be very important. And so it, it, it intrigued me that pi starts with a three. And then it's this, you know, quote unquote, irrational, transcendental number that just goes on into infinity. And yet it's all it is is essentially a circle. And so this just really intrigued me. Um, and then, you know, slowly I got into things like uh, Gematri and stuff like that. And I was just wondering, you know, is all this stuff tied together? You know, um, in the book, I mentioned that so many people of the past say that numbers are it. You know, it's like Galileo says, it's you know, mathematics is the language that God wrote um, the world in, essentially. Um, and so, yeah, I was just drawn to pi that way. Um, yeah, I guess that's all I can really say about it. Mm, no, it's it's really interesting. Well, uh, what what is it that we hear about the fact that we need to, you know, we're, we're trying to crack pi all the time. It's it's like it's a it's a mystery that is elusive. We can't get to it. The more we try to figure out the numbers, I, I don't even know personally how many numbers they're up to now. Was it a millions? Uh, what, do you know? No, I have no idea. Yeah, as soon as it gets past like a million, I'm like, okay, we've gone too far. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, and the idea of cracking pi always intrigued me too because how I came to understand it is that pi is actually a representation of um, the creation of our universe because the circle is one of the most you know holy revered symbols of all time, really. You know, so to me it was like it was almost like a riddle, and you're not supposed to crack pi, and what you're supposed to do is put it back together, is try to understand the number from the very beginning as three point one four, and then you know go on and try to understand the numbers as they relate to each other as they unfold into infinity. Um, 
And so heaven in sacred geometry was always known as a circle, as a three. And that immediately was like, oh, okay. Well, if the first thing in creation was as, you know, like uh, the alchemists know as like a philosopher's egg, or you have the hearing in Yarba and the Rig Veda, which everything was encased in an egg, then the diameter is actually the cracking of that egg. It's the cracking of pi. And so the riddle to me was like, okay, well, don't crack pi. Try to put it back together. You know, so try to link yourself back to the birth of creation. Interesting. So uh, there's a lot of different, um, you know, aspects and 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 the way you've 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 approached the subject matter. Uh, really interesting in the book the way you kind of lay it out in 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 different types of, yeah, well, you know, kind of mysteries that we know about things like uh, obviously squaring, you know, the circle, trying to find the mysteries behind the number, the the, the number. You know, why, I don't know. Do you look through one, two, ten as well? Kind of like Schneider did in that sense. I think you have a little bit more uh, kind of elusive mysteries, if you will, in there as well, like six, 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 and and stuff. But do you, do you cover from from one to ten the basics? Yeah, the first like thirty nine pages actually, um, which Christian equals thirty nine in the cipher that I'm sure we'll talk about here, but which is really interesting. I didn't know that when I wrote the book, but yeah, the first uh, few pages actually uh, go into uh, pi number one, what it is, the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter, and then I actually look at each of the numbers in the base ten system, you know, and focus on the Ennead, which is the one through nine essentially. Um, and the qualities of those numbers and the geometrics of those numbers. And, you know, as I understood it, that these, you know, one through nine and a zero basically give you the cosmic principles of the entire universe. And uh, this really resonates with the Greeks and the Egyptians because they both had the Ennead. And then you also have like um, the Christian angelic hierarchy is uh, nine stages and three levels, you know. Um, and then you look at the, the the great pyramid at Chichen Itza, and that's a nine level pyramid, you know. And so we you know, just kept coming back to this fact that it's nine, um, and so and then nine and a zero. And when you go uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and you get to ten, all you've done is go back to one and add a zero. And what's really interesting is one is an odd number and two is an even number. Three is an odd, four is an even. Well, when you get to nine, right, the next number is 10. And so if you add one plus zero, well, 10 is an even number. But if you add the one plus zero, now 10 becomes an odd number. And so this odd even, Shiva Shakti, Adam Eve kind of thing, goes throughout the rest of the number line into infinity. And so that was really intriguing to me that, you know, in every, uh, beyond the Ennead of nine, you know, the, the principles of nine, there's an odd and even in each number. And I found that very um, alchemical, if you will. Indeed. It's, uh, I think we should talk a little bit about uh, some of Mark Rodin's work. That's been a, seems to be a, a big influence uh, on you. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that was, um, you know, I had known about like decimal parity and theosophical addition where it's basically you take like a number like 46 and you add 4 plus 6 equals 10 and then you add the 1 plus 0 equaling 1, you know, breaking it down to any number between 1 through 9. And so I'd known about this for a long time. I think in, I first heard about it in um, Helena Blavatsky's work. Um, but I didn't know how you could actually use it. And then when I saw Marco Roden's work, um, it was like, oh, okay, well, here's, here's an enormous way you can use it, you know, it makes this perfect 64 uh, doubling and halving circuit. And so, yeah, it was, it was very influential. And the, the symbol itself, the fact that it looks like an infinity sign and, you know, 64 is known as a number of infinity. Um, it just really intrigued me. It also looks like angel's wings to me. That's the first thing I thought. So uh, immediately that brought me right back to spirituality and religion and the fact that he got this symbol through visions in meditation and through um, his adherence to the Baha'i faith. And so that was very intriguing to me as well. It, it seems that we can pick a lot of uh, symbols out of the... Uh the patterns that that, are, that arise in in mathematics. So, in a sense, we might look at the numbers just as as numbers. But in a sense, there is more there. We can begin to add, uh, you know, visual aids, I would say, to 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 understand the numbers, but but also to give them, in a sense, almost more uh, meaning. We have we have so many different things that arise from it. You know, as you mentioned just here with with Rodin's kind of, uh, you know, the the symbol that comes out of the vortex based math that he uh, you know talks about. We have, you know, the Mo Mobius strip. Uh, you even have a section in the book where you detail the eye, you know, the Egyptian eye of Horus, you know, and I've always looked at that one, by the way, as well, and quite not understood 
what people kind of mean, uh, you know, how you can find or, 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 or get the math out of a symbol like that. Is that something you could talk a little bit about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, first off, numbers are not only quantities, but qualities, and they also have geometric shapes. So when you look at, you know, certain numbers coming together to create ge geometry, you're actually creating symbols and, you know, archetypes and things like that. And this, these are languages. We don't understand that. Most people don't understand that these are languages. Symbols are languages. They speak to you subconsciously in a, in a subtextual way. And numbers do the same thing. Um, you know, uh, people are attached to numbers in a lot of ways. And we use numbers every single day. And a lot of times we don't even recognize it. So to me, when I started getting into numbers and started mirroring numbers, and understanding their you know qualities and essences and all of that it really started speaking to me on a level you know and according to a lot of people that mathematics is the language of god well then it's like okay well is god speaking to me then <laughs> you know I, i mean that's and i got a, a very spiritual if you will aspect from it i mean um So it's it's just going on from there. It's yeah. almost like I learned two other languages, you know, symbols and and mathematics, and geometry, if you will. Well, I mean, a lot of people uh, talk about that, and I think it's a pretty good, you know, point. It's an interesting point about where is God in all of this? We we're we're in a sense we end up here. Uh, we don't really know where we come from, uh, you know, except if we look at the fact that we have the ability to examine those these things, but. You know, as far as we know, when we come here, we don't know squat. It's, we're just, you know, here we are, and, and what the hell is going on kind of thing. But yeah. in a way, are you saying that God actually is speaking to us, but we're not paying, you know, close enough attention, basically? Um, yeah, I don't want... I'm, I, I guess I can say this, is ultimately the conclusion that I've come to, with a lot of trepidation, mind you, is that we are God. We are God looking at itself. Um, that we are an undivided section of the whole thing. And unity has been such a prominent idea and concept, and, and it is the circle as well. I mean, a circle encapsulates the most amount of space with the least amount of effort. And so this idea of unity and monotheism, the reason it's monotheism is because there is a wholeness and one, you know. Well, even the Eye of Horus, as you just mentioned, was called the Wedget, and that means whole one. And so... What uh, Alan Watts has this great quote where he says, um, the further and further we look out with our telescopes and the further and further we look in with our microscopes, the larger and larger and smaller and smaller the universe has to become in order to escape the investigation because we are the universe looking at itself. We are God looking at itself. And I think this is, as far as I can tell, the secret teachings of all ages. It's what the mystics and magis and people that sought enlightenment in the past finally came to. And this is all over, like the Corpus Hermeticum and, you know, the book, The Holy Science and a lot of these things, you know, or, you know, be as Christ, if you will. So why do you think there is that so many mathematicians miss this or maybe they don't all, all, all do? It might just be that they're, they don't talk about it and certain people certainly stumble into it. But what is the what is the component, do you think, that makes you know, your work different in that way, that you, you take it a step further than most people who work with numbers actually uh, do? What is that little extra bit, if you will? Um, well, going back to Marco's work, um, this idea of theosophical addition or Pythagorean addition, you know, it's called a bunch of different things, digital root, it's not accepted by modern mathematicians. Um, at all. In fact, when I first came across Marco's work, I, I spent a, uh, like literally probably like three weeks to a month figuring out if the guy was full of crap. Yeah. You know, so I, I, I sent it to some of the mathematicians in Eugene, actually. So I was like, hey, what do you guys think of this? You know, some of the professors. And they basically wrote me back saying that, well, it uses numerology, so it's defunct. It, it doesn't mean anything, you know. And I was, I was just almost like flabbergasted by this because I'm not a mathematician, you know, I, I really even don't think I am a mathematician anymore, a math magician maybe. <laughs> But um, so this really, it just dumbfounded me. I was like, well, how can something so simple and beautiful not be correct? You know, because at the heart, nature is simple and beautiful. Nature's going to find the simplest and easiest way to do something, you know. Um, when you look at all of the um, theories that are, permeate our math, they're all simple. A squared plus B squared equals C squared e equals MC squared. You know, the, the equation for fractals is essentially Z equals Z squared plus C. 
you know, uh, the Fibonacci sequence is just adding the number previous to the number you added. You know, the zero plus one equals one, one plus one equals two, two plus one equals, this is all simple stuff. And so I see mathematics as very complicated and most people do. It's very, and we're taught that it's very complicated, you know, that it's very cold and dry and it doesn't have any relationship to our life. And so that was the first thing that caught me was that, okay, Pythagorean addition or theosophical addition is legitimate, absolutely legitimate. And all of these mystics used it before. So that was, you know, that was the one thing that really caught my eye. And the other thing is that you constantly have this idea of everything in nature is mirrored. You know, in uh, the principle of mechanics, it's called the principle of parity, I believe. And, or, or um, what you have it in the, the scripture, as above, so below, on earth as it is in heaven. Right. Earth is a reflection of heaven, and heaven is a reflection of earth. You know, and then you can see this everywhere. You can't, anything that you look at has this duality to it. You can look at the human body or a leaf or a bug or, you know, the earth itself as a northern, northern hemisphere and a southern hemisphere. So this idea of duality is in everything. You know, tonight it is going to be night and tomorrow it's going to be day. And that's just the way it is, you know. So I started looking at numbers as in like, okay, the number 32 is also in one way the number 23. So, you know, I just mirrored that number and then started looking at things like that. And then I actually did this with a number line and, and, and I just kept going with it. And to me, it seems very legitimate, almost as if there in every matter, there is a spirit. So maybe the matter, the number is 32, but the spirit is 23, if, if, if you get what I'm saying. So there, what you're saying is that there is a relationship between all the numbers as well. You can't just... Uh once you look at one one number set, if you will, this is going to have a reflection in some way into other numbers. Yes, yeah. I mean, I think the numbers work off each other in magical ways. I mean, I don't have any other word for it, you know. Um, and I think Marco's work shows that. And, you know, there's definitely other things um, that I put in the book that I think show that as well. For sure. For sure. There's so much to the this uh, subject, of course. What, what, why don't we talk a little bit about the, the language as, aspect, which is very... Uh, very very interesting it goes into uh, gematria of gematria of course and and you've even uh, you made a couple of videos about this specifically i looked through the uh, the english alphabet video uh, very mm -hmm. very interesting T tell us a little bit about this and, and break it down for someone who who are not familiar with, with the with this particular approach marty well um when i started getting into gematria gematria whatever however you say it um i was I ultim ultimately i was like intrigued i was like okay well the you know the Hebrews and the Kabbalah they you know this is the way it was done. Gematria was how they understood this, and so I was you know, I was just automatically I was like hmm I wonder if there's one for the English alphabet you know, and so I worked on this and worked on it and you know finally I came across basically several things that really helped me and that was like the Jewish menorah, um, the tetragrammaton which is the basically the symbol pi seven pi seven and then I use the Freemasonic symbol of the, the compass and the square and the G and so I was like okay well how do I put numbers to these letters there's 26 letters you know and so immediately it was like okay well there has to be a left and a right there has to be a Shiva and a Shakti or a, a, a Adam and Eve if you will black and white and so I basically just separated the alphabet you know A through M and N through Z and then I just used mythological motifs, basically the seven days of creation, six days where God did work, and then the seventh day where he rested. So, I, you know, so you can take A through M and then N through Z, and then you can walk up, you know, A is one, B is two, walk up to G is seven, and that's where, you know, the Sabbath, and then you can just walk back down to six, five, four, three, two, one, ending on M. And then since you have 13 letters and 13 letters, you can do the same with, you know, the other side of the alphabet, N through Z. And there's, um, I don't have it with me, but there's a line that Albert Pike says in Secret Teachings of All Ages where he's talking about the Kabbalah and how it's just so simple and profound in that it's, you know, it's got theorems more spectacular than Pythagoras and all of these things. And the one thing that really caught me is that it could be done on the human hands. And so immediately I was like, all right, well, if it can be, if that can be done in the human hands, then the English alphabet has to as well. And so I just laid my hands out and I said, A is my thumb and Z is my other thumb. 
And then, you know, you have 12 sections of your four fingers being, you know, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, and then N through Z on your right hand. And then you can actually underline the prime numbers, which are uh, 2, 3, 5, 7, and then 5, 3, 2, and that adds up to 27. Well, there's 27 bones in the human hand. So A through M is 27 prime numbers and 27 bones in the human hand, and then N through Z is... 27 and then you know just a, it's a mirror you know so hmm. there once again you have the duality and so this was very profound to me and then further um you know you can add the non-prime numbers which leaves you one four six and six four one on your left hand and then the same on your right hand and six plus six is twelve four plus four is eight and one plus one is two and twelve plus eight plus two is twenty two and this leads you right to the g and the seven so 22 divided by 7 is pi. So you have pi in your left hand and pi in your right hand, and that comes together to give you the tetragrammaton, or pi 7, pi 7. Pi begotten by 7 and pi begotten by 7. It's the holy name of God. And I found this extremely intriguing. And so I just started working with these numbers, and um, now I'm writing another book. So. Well, there you go. Wow. Uh, th this is a, the book you have out now, Pi the Great Work. It's about... Uh, you know, 100 pages, really condensed with a lot of stuff, excellent graphics, obviously, to go along with this as we're talking about this, because it's uh, somewhat difficult maybe to convey some of the ideas without imagery with this, but but you're doing a great job. And, and uh, the uh, the question that we always kind of come to, I guess, in a sense, when we talk about these things is the um, the awareness involved when, when man is, is creating uh, these things. Uh, what level that is. Uh, I mean, at some point or another, the English, for instance, an alphabet has been made or, or, or created or composed, at least put together by, uh, you know, some people speculate that, uh, you know, people like Francis Bacon was involved in this. There's other people. Uh, it certainly has been around, you know, longer than that. But there is a, when people come together and do these things, what do you think at this point, the level of awareness is uh, within that? Do they know what they're doing? Do they base uh, their creations, so to speak, on these ratios, on these numbers, on these rules and, and laws, in a sense, that you're talking about? Um, yeah, ultimately, I don't have an answer for that because, like, I've, I've started researching, like, where did this stuff come from, you know? Where did Gematria come from? Where did languages come from? I mean, as of right now, I think there's, like, 6,000 languages that are spoken on the planet, you know? <laughs> and right. so where do these things come from and why so many different languages? And really, you can't trace back to any one particular culture that, you know, created the language and assuredly did it. You know, it's, it was almost like it's evolved just like everything else, you know. And so, yeah, I guess I just don't have an answer for that. I mean, if somebody did create it, damn, were they smart, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they really knew geometry. They really knew symbol. They really knew the mathematics, you know. And uh, to me, if they did create it, then they were the gods on earth, you know. Um, exactly. You know, they were, the, I mean, there seems to be kind of a like a, a primordial language. Some people have been trying to tra trace this. I mean, it, it almost like it's go back to some kind of, uh, you know, pr proto-Phoenician type, uh, you know, Indo-European type of language. Um, that that seems to have spread, you know, to all the corners of the world, and then we see different variations of this. Because in one sense or another, uh, majority of the languages, anyway, are related in some sense. We have weird things like the, uh, for instance, you know, the Rongo Rongo script uh, coming, you know, out from Easter Island that has uh, seems to have in the symbolism of the language itself, the the shapes of each letter uh, has clues about. Uh, uh, you know, some people have attracted to, to, to even like, uh, you know, plasma type events in the heavens that these are, there are clues in there, um, which is just amazing. If, if, if that's true, that means that it actually has a, a reflection in, you know, the letters themselves has a reflection in the nature, something that was visible and, and observable. Have, have you heard about that, Marty? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't heard about that particular one, but, you know, definitely looking into this, it seems like there is a base of all languages, you know. Um, that there's certain sounds like ah and ooh and I mean even when you speak you know what's the when we, you know when we're trying to think of what we want to say and we're like um um right well yep. a u m is um right you know and yep. that starts with an a as in an alpha you know so I think that certain sounds and vibrations actually have and we know this from uh, somatics that they actually have um, geometric qualities and therefore have numbers that we can assign them to. 
So when languages are evolved or born or, uh, you know, however they come to fruition, it's almost like they're following a fundamental pattern. And I equate this to, well, something as simple as the Fibonacci sequence, you know, the same sequence that's in a flower is in your body and it's in every living thing. So why maybe language has the same thing, you know, there's many different flowers and they all, but they all grow from a different sequence. Now there's trilliums and there's lilies and there's orchids and there's roses, you know, but they all speak the same language, if you will, you know, if, if you know what I'm saying. Mm. And I also see that, you know, this idea of uh, the rose cross, you know, the rose on the center of the cross as that's what it resonated with me. That's what it was kind of telling me that language actually is a flower. It's the flowering of, of speech, you know. So how much do you think that the esoteric, um, you know, branches of, of uh, uh, the secret societies have in, in all of this? If we look at the Freemasonic tradition, many people, you know, say that it actually uh, traces back to, to an earlier tradition, which is in, uh, you know, majority at least today kind of has been lost. I mean, we have Masonic scholars that are out and trying to find uh, the roots and, and origins of their own traditions that they adhere to, which is kind of strange in a sense. But um, yeah. the Rosicrucians, then, for instance, there too, we have the Rose Cross. What, what do they know? Do they do they know all of this stuff that you're talking about? Do you think? That's an excellent question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm getting into Freemasonry quite a bit, and I've, I've always had an interest in it, especially in the last couple of years. Um, and, you know, I've actually spoken to a few Freemasons, and as far as I know, I mean, I don't know what level they are or what degree they are, but a lot of these people don't know this, you know, or don't even understand what this, you know, square in the circle means. And that's like the, their, you know, their insignia, that is their main symbol. Yeah. So... Uh, so I don't know if it's if it's lost or you know if the people in the upper echelon know it and they use it to their advantage. Um, I don't really see Freemasonry as as like an evil institution. Um, I believe it's an institution, and any institution can become corrupted, whether it's political, you know, um, religious, whatever it is. So yeah, I mean, for, but f the one thing that really gets me is that it's stuck around, you know, and it seems to have all these roots in. As far as I can tell, alchemy and you know Egypt uh, especially, and so maybe it's stu you know it's stuck around because it's numbers you know it's numbers, language, geometry, sound all rolled into one, and it has to stick around it you know. Um, I, I guess I don't really have a good answer as far as like you know how did they lose it, and if it's so right. important you know wh where did it go, and I mean. Yeah, I just I, I guess I can't answer that just yet. Hopefully, I'll be able to someday. <laughs> we're uh, we're going to continue continue looking for those kinds of answers. It's a it's a it's fascinating. It's always been an interesting you know, uh, subject to me in that sense that we uh, we have the echoes of the of of some kind of earlier tradition in a sense. It feels like and and for some reason uh, it's been it's been lost and it's kind of been waxing and waning almost in a sense throughout history as well. It comes and goes. It, it gets you know stronger in a sense in certain periods and then it kind of. Uh, dies down a bit. We have a renaissance, and then it, you know, di dies down a bit. And and this seems to, you know, go back to the hermetic tradition that you mentioned earlier as well. That this is uh, something w that is contained within there, and people can understand parts of the wisdom, perhaps. But even those small, little, tiny parts help incredibly to to advance humanity to to a new level of understanding. That's amazing to me. Yeah, and I mean the Rosicrucians. Speaking of. Um they they said that they go through a period of activity and inactivity, and this is a period of 108 years, which I found really interesting. And and and, and if you just look at nature herself, you know, she ebbs and flows. You know, high tides, low tides. You know, um, uh, you know, in the Bible it says, uh, "To everything, turn, turn, turn." There is a season. Turn, turn, turn. You know, and what that what's it saying is that consciousness and our understanding of these things has a winter and it has a summer and you know our great year as you know Walter Cruttenden his you know postulizes that the consciousness is intimately linked to this so there is a point there's a golden age and then there is a dark age and currently I think we might be in a dark age I think we were coming out of it um, but and I you know you and I are part of that you know I don't you know I think that we're helping bring it on but I think that we're just part of the flow of the whole thing you know um, people have mentioned uh, like oh I don't how are you coming up with this 
and you know this is great work you know this sort of thing and I really don't even feel like I'm doing it you know um, when I did the video for the chess thing I was I sat back and I was just like oh, wait wait chess encodes pi and a lunar and solar processional calendar I was really just bereft I was I was like I don't even really feel like I'm doing this you know and the only way I can really understand that is um, being a songwriter and after doing this for years and years and years it's like you get this spark you get this ounce of creativity that that comes in it's like the angel comes in or the muse or the helping hand or mm. the you know the anthropos or Damon whatever it is comes in and it gives you a line gives you a riff gives you a melody an idea and to me it's almost like that idea is an entire song in and of itself, you know? And so it's just giving you, it's basically like, here's a stone and beneath this stone is David, but you have to whittle away. You're not really doing it. You know, um, it's actually underneath there and all you have to do is chip at it. It's always been there, you know? So, um, yeah. And actually Elizabeth Gilbert, who wrote that Eat, Pray, Love has a great Ted talks about this, about how she was releasing, uh, Eat, Pray, she released Eat, Pray, Love and it was this monumental success. And then she had to release her follow up to it. And she was, you know, psychologically scared. And mm -hmm. so she went back to the Greeks and they had the daemons, you know, and so the, and the daemons were, you know, it was, it was the idea of not being a genius, but having a genius, you know? And I really resonate with this because after years of, like I said, songwriting, it's like, I don't really feel like if I write a decent song, it's almost like, how did I even do that? You know, <laughs> <laughs> well, where did that come from? How can I just spew out, you know, a, a list full of lyrics in, you know, 15 minutes, you that's know, right. and where, you know, and so, I, I don't yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was just going to ask you then. So wh where do you think it, it comes? Well, you mentioned the muse, obviously, that we have something coming into it. But uh, th that puts us in a different role where we are merely kind of the conduits of something that is going to come out in a sense. And, and it's almost more up to if we're open or, if you will, willing or, in, you know, in a position where we can en enable this flow to come out through. And some people seem to be able to tap into that more. So they are like just, in a sense, willingly tapping into something the force the the creativity out there and then mm -hmm. they, they they just managed to you know to receive those initial sparks that you mentioned and do something on it do, do you think there is some level of i don't know maybe not tweaking but there must be a some level of harnessing these ideas and 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 kind of just learning to maybe work with them as in in a spe specific way as well to to be well maybe not to be successful but to present and get out those ideas in in a powerful way what do you think um, yeah, I think it's I think it's all about the work, you know. I mean, this is why I think it's called like the labor of the Lord or the great work, the magnum opus, you know. Um, it's choosing to do the work and letting it come out, you know. Um, and I think this might be where having faith comes in in a way, you know. Um, going back to you know duality and like, you know this sort of thing, I've heard so many people talk about demons and how they're evil or how they're really good or you know it's it's always one or the other they're coming and they're trying to you know steer humanity in the wrong way well i you know in the experiential world you always have this duality so it's no coincidence that you know daemon and demon are so close right. in the language in linguist in you know linguistically um and so really it's you choosing how to see it is it the devil on your left shoulder or is it the angel on your right you know um the same, you know, I call spirits um, the serpent because that's how that, you know, basically that's what the mythologies told me to tell, you know, to say it. Um, and the spirit is, the serpent is, um, it's the height, um, how the best to say it, it's, the, it's your, it's your worst nightmare in your finest hour, mm -hmm. you know. It's you can get, you know, I'm a musician, so you can get on stage and you can be like, I'm, I'm just going to get in tune with the crowd and I'm going to get up there and I'm going to be, you know, no ego. And I'm just going to present my all and give it my hardest and play to my heart. Or you can get on stage and be like, I'm better than everybody else. Look at me. I got a guitar. You know what I mean? Right. right. And, and then you can fail, fail horribly. You know, and so I think and why, is, you know, the serpent is the spirit is because it's slippery. It's slippery as all hell, you know, mm -hmm. can get away from you. And I think the idea of doing the great work or, you know, the alchemical work is to get up every day, grab the serpent by its neck, look it dead in its eyes, take your sword and put it right in its head and say, I own you. You don't own me. 
and I have to work to keep you, you know, hold of you. Mm-hmm. And I, 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 you know, I think that mythologizing this stuff is so awesome. You know, like right. you don't even have to believe in like any god or anything like that to be like, man, you know, World of Warcraft is awesome. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know that sort of thing. People can get into these things. You know, princesses and dragons, and demons and angels and stuff like that. And they, you know, they could be atheists. But for some reason, it really resonates with us. Yeah, it attracts so many people from all walks of life. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Huh. So, in a sense, it's it's like um, exactly it can be a it can be a very in in that sense an evil force to you personally. It can be a it can be a, a, a very detrimental to you if you don't know how to handle it right, or if you don't, uh, in a sense, also maybe have. I don't know, respect for it, but at the same time, you need to have no fear. You need to be bold and actually dare to do it because it's only then when you actually can uh, begin to to do some of the great work in a sense. So it's, we, it, what's happening here in a sense, Marty, is we have, this is reflected within us. We we pick and choose sides of this all the time in a sense. We are, we are no matter how much we want to or not, we are stuck in that duality. We have that reflected within us as a, as a pattern all the, all, the, all the time. We have the black and the white. We have good and evil in us and we're constantly going back and forth and trying to kind of you know find our way in this find the balance between these uh you know components or or properties of nature and then in in the process try to try to do something great out of it because some people would say here as they listen to this these are you know evil esoteric uh, satanic even traditions that we should stay far far away from right Yeah, yeah. And I think this um, harkens to the um, alchemical marriage or the alchemical wedding, you know, um, that there's a duality inside you. And the the only way to understand everything is to unify them, you know. Um, and I understood this as um, like Jungian psychology really, really pointed me to this because there's an idea that's called the anima and the animus. And it's basically like, and every man is a woman and every woman is a man. You know, and so and it's identifying as a man, identifying with your female side, you know, identifying with that, um, you know, the more poetic, if you will, side. Um, and I think this is what the alchemists were talking about. And so I actually look, okay, well, where do you find this? You know, um, well, you can find it in Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci's uh, The Mona Lisa. You know, he actually modeled that painting after himself after the features of himself you know well why would he do that you know and why is this painting so famous you know how it's super small number one it's like what are the dimensions you know nothing by nothing it's super (laughs) tiny you know Mm. and she's got this little smirk and she's looking at you you know and so that's leonardo da vinci looking at you as his female self and this is what it said to me and what's interesting is that i did the numerical equivalent for mona lisa number one it's called mona And Mona is a reference to the monad, the Greek monad, which is the same as the Egyptian sun glyph. It's just literally, you take a compass, you pierce a page, you make a point, and then you make a circle. And this is the, the same glyph in Egypt and, and Greece. And, mm-hmm. and it is and, not related to the moon, though, because of the word. Um, it, well, I think, you know, it might be as well. Um, but um, the, the thing that told me was, okay... Mm-hmm. So the interior female of Leonardo da Vinci was Mona Lisa, okay? So then I did the uh, numerical equivalent of Mona Lisa and adds up to 19. Well, the monad in the Greek uh, gematria added up to 361, and the square root of 361 is 19. Hmm. And so I was you know, I was really captivated by that. Um, and I think it's a truism that our culture just doesn't want to accept you know i live in southern wisconsin and if you went and had a beer at the, you know the bar and told some guy there it's like hey you got a woman inside you he'd be like what are you talking about bro you know i mean you know <laughs> right, like right. They, it would just be like you, you you're crazy you mm-hmm. know and so i took this and i in the book i took it very poetically i took i, I called my female self claudia pavonis and so any poetic line that i put in there was under her name so Interesting. Do, do you think that there is a, and this seems to be true in, in, you know, if we look at scripture as well, there there seems to be uh, an interesting um, schism or, 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 or problem that arises when people also make literal interpretations of esoteric traditions. Um, you know, this could be echoed, for instance, in, in the in the sense of, uh, you know, uh, you know the, the androgynous is, is a, or, or even the... Uh, You know, hermaphrodite. This is like 
to show that this is going back to uh, to Hermes and, and, and Aphrodite, the Herm Aphrodite. This is a, the combination of the two, right? But in a sense, some people make literal interpretation of this. We have an interesting, uh, you know, transhuman movement that, that seems to be moving towards the androgynous ideal, for instance. And that, to me, anyway, seems like a very, very literal interpretation. It's like what you said, you know, this is components that are within you that you need to recognize. It doesn't matter if you try to externally make yourself into into both what what do you think marty um yeah i think it goes back to the whole idea that we are god looking at itself you know the this idea of the virgin birth you know like the virgin mary well virgin originally mean unmarried you know so the unmarried married you know uh so it's just like combining the two and the first why we have this duality in us is because the first thing was androgynous the first thing was neither man nor female, and this first thing cracked, you know, if you will, and created the two sides, created the Garden of Eden, you know, or when Adam and Eve were casted out of the Garden of Eden, you know. And so this is why I think that we, this is why I think this psych, psychological idea is so resonant in, well, in me, and I think a lot of the people in the past, you know, and exactly, I mean, Hermes, I mean, it tells you right there, he was a hermaphrodite, yeah. you know. Um, so what more can you say? He obviously had a female aspect inside him. And I, you know, just like I said, I think psych psychologically this does wonders for oneself. I mean, it's done wonders for me, you know. It may not make me popular at that bar that I was talking about, but... <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe that's so, not uh, the most important thing in the world either. So, yeah, exactly, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, it's exactly. It's about your, you know, working on yourself uh, in that sense. What, where you want to head, where you want to go, what do you want to do in your life, in a sense, and how much of it do you want to understand? Because this is one one idea that came to me earlier, or, or as you were talking about this, uh, that the fact that you know someone like you and 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 me who have you know at least a basic understanding of these things ha can see these patterns in. Uh, you know, in in the reality around me, in in even some things that man makes, but primarily actually in 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 nature, the patterns that is in how a tree grows, or or you know different you know ratios that is simply there. But most people, if we just go back to that for a second, still does not recognize that 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 they are truly living in in a bubbly and bubble, uh, totally you know cornered off from the rest of of uh, reality in a sense. So why is that? Do you think that if we have these patterns within us, why don't we why don't why don't most people see it or, or or recognize it and the fact that we miss it while other people just are on it right away? What do you think? Um, well, I'm still trying to get it. You know, I don't really feel like I have it or anything like that. That's for sure. You know, I mean, I think everybody has their own path um, that they that they take in their life. Um, number one, I think that this knowledge has been lost, whether it's because we're on a low tide of nature or, you know, I think there's a Buddhist idea or Hindu idea, I'm not sure which one it is, but that God plays hide and seek with himself, that he loses himself and then he finds himself, you know, and this really resonates with the whole, you know, golden age, dark age kind of thing. Um, so, um, well, for instance, when I was getting into the sacred geometry and stuff like that, and I was like, wow, sacred number. I remember I had this friend, he, I was reading the quadrivium, and he's like, does that say sacred number? Like, are you kidding me? You know? Hmm. And it's, I mean, so many people do not even know about certain things like this, that do, actually doing geometry can help you understand, as far as I see or am concerned, creation, you know? Um, and even myself, when I came across the Tetractus, I was like, there's a, there's a prayer to the Tetractus. I was like, what? <laughs> Your prayer, you're, you're having a prayer to a mathematical idea? That seems ludicrous to me. But now it seems absolutely perfect in a way. It seems completely legitimate. Um, so we've lost a lot of this knowledge. And the fact that, um, you know, our churches are teaching the fact that this is, a, you know, the Bible is a literal document. And to me, the people that wrote the Bible wrote it in such a way that we would never think this, you know. Um, I really like the comedian Joe Rogan. Uh, not that I always agree with him or anything, but he has this great bit about Noah's Ark, you know. And he says, um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to be offensive here because I'm just quoting a comedian. But he says, oh, that's okay. if, you Go told, ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, if you told the story of Noah's Ark to an eight-year-old retarded boy, he's going to have some questions, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know um, 
God commanded Noah to build an ark and, you know, got all the animals two by two to come from around the world. And he sailed 40 days and 40 nights until civilization began anew. You know, this you know, and the punchline is that, you know, an eight year old retarded boy is going to have some questions. And, you know, it, it's right. such a mythological idea that to literally believe it seems ludicrous to me, you know, but at the same time. Now that I've that I've come to understand more mythologies, I think that they're more important than history itself, because we can't even we don't even know what has actually happened in history. People say, oh, you know, the Romans did this or the Chaldeans did this, you know, and just because somebody wrote something down doesn't necessarily mean that. Absolutely it's true. right. Absolutely. You know, right. yeah. I mean, just look at how 9-11 is going to go down in history. You know, yeah. I read the 9-11 Commission report and it's a pile of shit. But. You know, and so what's going to happen 100 years? Is that going to be the historical document? So when you actually look throughout history, you can't say that this is exactly what happened, but this is exactly what happened. But what you can do is look at all the mythologies and understand that there is a thing called enlightenment and there is a path that you can take. It's called the way. It's called, you know, the magnum opus. It's called the labor of the lore, the alchemical dream, whatever you want to call it. But this is a very true thing. Um, and I mean, just look at the characters of, you know, um, Orpheus, um, Dionysus, Jesus, Horus, Atlas, Ophiuchus. What do all these things have in common? Us, mm. you know, and that, I, I think this is what they were saying, you know, and the fact that, that you and us, this us is probably a, um, a numerical vibration that that is actually signifying all of humanity. What we're doing today, uh, Marty, so we're, we're the majority, in a way, uh, if we generalize here, are going the literal way. We are collecting uh, data in, in that sense more and more about every single little event. And of course, the, the, the truth of those events uh, can and should uh, be argued, of course. It's a kind of a mistake, uh, as you say, to, to walk this path, I think, because we, we're not, this could be lost, first of all incredibly quick overnight if something happens today even more so because i mean in the past uh, things burned down and it was all lost uh in other cases it, it could be a, a data loss today we could have a big cme smack our computers and that's it we lose everything yeah. um but a story if we have a, a, a small story it, the, the, and that is orally you know transmitted or or you know conveyed throughout the the centuries we're still going to have uh, the basics of that. What, why do you say that a story is more powerful in that sense than, than piles and piles of data or, or, or history? What it, it encapsulates quite a bit. That, that's what you're saying, right? Yeah, uh, be, uh, because of just like what you just said, you know, that the whole thing could fall. You know, the Library of Alexandria burned twice. You know, how much information was lost there? But we still have the story of Isis and Osiris, you know. Yeah. And what does that story mean to us, you know? Um, I mean, if... You know, if all the Bibles of the world burned, you know, we would still have the story of Jesus on the cross. And if we look at the symbolic, you know, um, you know, metaphorical, you know, linguistic, numerical ideas of this story, and we really, really penetrate it, then I think that we'll understand, uh, you know, I think this is why these stories have lasted. Absolutely. I, I think so, too. There's a, a powerful message in them. And again, I think we all have we we resonate with them for different uh, different reasons and 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 I've always been intrigued with greek uh you know mythology and other kinds of mythology from from all over the world and there are so many fascinating stories out there that I think can teach us things they they tell us um they can teach us about our own life the the, the challenges that we will you know we're going to face throughout our lives as well it's it's just amazing when you think about it and uh, you know in the in the next hour Marty I want to you know dive into some of the you know more details about things like like chess that you that you mentioned briefly. I want to talk a little bit more about that because that's fascinating. I want to talk about uh, squaring the circle as well. Some of the other things that you have contained in your book. But let's uh, spend a little time um, plugging it, if you will, as well, because it's it's available. It's called Pi, the Great Work. is available on I guess Amazon.com would be the best place to go. Is that correct, uh, Marty? Yes. Yeah, that's the best place. Yeah. Absolutely. And then uh, yeah, go ahead. 
Um, actually, I, we, I just thought of something that I was that I came to like about three, four days ago, and we were just talking the last thing about Greek civilization, you know. And um, one thing I came to was the idea of Apollo was the hero at, at Delphi, you know, he was the guy that slayed the serpent dragon Typhon or whatever, right? And so I was like thinking about our language, and I was like, I apologize, you know. Well, break that down, you know. What is jize? Jize is a lot like guys or a veil or a mask. You know, and Apollo is, of course, the hero there. So what are you saying when you say I apologize? You're saying I screwed up. I made a mistake. I was judgmental against you. You know, I did something that I shouldn't have done, but I am not that person. I am really Apollo in disguise. That's what you're <laughs> saying, you know, things like that. And I think it's embedded in our language. And the fact that there's numerical equivalents to it, I think, can point to a lot of different things. Um, for instance... I'm going to just say this real quick. Uh, Sphinx equals 24. Bishop equals 24. Egypt equals 24. Earth equals 24. Israel equals 24. You know, how many hours in a day are on Earth? Mm. You know, 24. You know, Israel is heaven on Earth. You know, Egypt was heaven on Earth. You know, so, um, yeah. Very interesting. There, there's so much to it, of course, and uh, and we just begun to scrape uh, the surface and, and, and the the roots of it, the intentions of it, and how these traditions are passed down to us, in, in a sense, is also something I want to try to get a little bit closer uh, at, in, in a sense, because we we're, 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 we have the traditions coming through, but we're not quite, we're not getting it, in a sense, either. And, and I think some of your work here is about opening up a little bit of that. Some people might argue, too, of course, that this is, eh, well, whatever, you know, you can find anything in numbers. I've heard that so many times. I want to get your, get your take on that, too, Marty, would you? What do you think about that? And, and personally, I, I believe that that's true, though, because you can uh, and, and will and should find everything in the numbers because it might indeed be number driven, as you mentioned in the beginning. Um, what is the main website to give out here as well, Marty? Is it your a YouTube channel? Yeah, um, right now I have a, I have a website that I'm working on. It's just not going to be up for a little while, just because I'm kind of busy right now. But um, I'm definitely working on another book right now, and it's going really well. And yeah, I do have a book uh, available on CreateSpace and, and Amazon.com. But yeah, and I will be posting more videos. But you can just uh, visit my YouTube channel, Marty Leads Thirty Three. Excellent. Uh, YouTube.com forward slash Marty Leads dot uh, Thirty Three. Marty Leads Thirty Three. That's the channel. We're going to link that up as well. And we're going to have links to the book as well. So in case you're interested, in case you want to see more uh, practical of the you know, some of the examples here that we talked about, uh, pick up a copy of the book. You won't be disappointed, I think, because it's a lot of fascinating you know, information in there. You've, you've done a really good job condensing all of this, so condensing some of the more difficult uh, ideas. And then I urge people to go and check out some of the videos there as well. Uh, excellent uh, you know, aid to, uh, to, to present some of the things that are already in the book as well, Marty. So great work on that. Uh, stay with us and we'll continue with more uh, after this break. In the second hour, we explore what would change if people truly understood the sacred aspects of math, mythology and esoteric teachings. Marty says that everything in math points us to love. We have an unconscious knowledge of numbers and our connection to them. Then we'll talk about the esoteric side of squaring the circle, 666, the number 64, and more. Leeds tells us about the symbolism found in the game of chess. Marty also mentions the connection between synchronicity and numbers. We'll talk about how numbers speak to us and why. Later we talk about the holographic universe made up of a matrix of numbers. Marty discusses free will as choices within a perimeter. And Leeds ends the hour sharing a vision he had of the electric serpent. To listen to the next hour, subscribe for a membership with Red Eyes Creations. All the information is available on the website redeyescreations.com. Much more is coming up in the next hour that you shouldn't miss. With a membership, you'll also get full access to all of our archives. Tons of material for you to study, learn and get excited about. Things that you can share with your friends, your family. And I think one of the most important things that we can do right now is to learn as much as we can to become wiser and to attain true understanding and wisdom. Next up on Red Ice Radio, we have Sterling Allen for a free energy news update. Some exciting developments on this front. After this, we have Christy Wanson joining us to talk about the horrible story of the kidnapping of his son Dominic by the Swedish state. Then we have Louis Turi, Matt Stein, Stefan Molyneux, Desiree and JJ Hurtak, William Davis, Mark Weber, Mary Sean Young, Court Lindahl, Tom Horn, Jay Widener, Dean Clifford and Jordan Maxwell, to name a few. But stay with us now as we continue to discuss Pi, the great work with Marty Leeds, coming right up after this break. Mm-hmm.